This is Dr. Joe Toro from Ocean County Sports Medicine and Rutgers Medical School. And in this slide presentation, I'm going to be discussing stem cells, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, and other types of growth factors. And we're going to discuss uh, whether these represent advances in healing or whether they are snake oil. Our primary goal in orthopedics is to prevent tendon, ligament, and joint injuries. But if injuries occur, we want to facilitate proper healing. And one of the ways we've done this up to now is with improvements in rehabilitation and also with improvements in our surgical techniques. So for instance, uh, in the case of anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, if you look at the picture all the way on the left, that's uh, a harvest of a bone patella tendon bone graft uh, from the knee. And this is still done today and uh, still a very good graft. In the middle slide, you'll see how we're actually putting that graft in. Uh, the previous technique involved drilling a hole in the tibia and then through that hole placing a guide wire and then drilling a hole in the femur, so-called transtibial technique. And uh, you see the graft in place held with screws on the right. The problem with this technique is that the graft placement is actually a little bit too vertical. In other words, straight up and down. And what that does is it prevents anterior motion of the tibia underneath the femur, which is good, but it doesn't prevent rotational uh, motion of the tibia underneath the femur, which is not as good. And the picture on the right shows the way we do these ACL reconstructions now. And you can see that graft position is more horizontal which is more anatomically correct. And uh, this reconstruction prevents abnormal rotation much better than the older reconstruction on the left. And this has really been made possible by improvements in the technology we have available for doing these reconstructions. And likewise, in rotator cuff repair, there've been great improvements over the years. Here's a picture on the left of an open rotator cuff repair. And the right-hand picture shows an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, which we can do through very small incisions. And it's less traumatic. It results in less pain after the operation, less scar tissue, and an easier rehabilitation. And clinically, arthroscopic rotator cuff repair has over a 90% success rate. The way both open and arthroscopic reconstructions used to be done is uh, using anchors that go in the bone, and in those anchors are sutures which go through the tendon and hold the tendon back down to the bone, as you can see in the picture on the left. Technological improvements now have allowed us to produce a stronger cuff repair, you can see in the picture on the right, which is box-shaped and has anchors both towards the inside and outside of the tendon, which is a stronger repair, which in most cases heals uh, better. Because as you can see from the arrow in that right picture, it holds the tendon down on a broader surface of the bone, uh, which allows for stronger healing. So with the so-called single row repair on the left, about 70% of those rotator cuff repairs heal completely. And when we can do the double row repair shown on the right, we've improved that healing rate to about 85%. But of course, that's still not 100% and there's room for improvement. The problem is from a mechanical point of view, we pretty much maxed out what we can do with something like a rotator cuff uh, or even an ACL. But uh, from a biological point of view, in other words, using growth factors and stem cells to stimulate healing, we've only really started to scratch the surface of what can be done. So what are growth factors? Well, growth factors are molecules or mixtures of molecules that can stimulate the growth and reproduction of cells. And uh, for instance, one example is erythropoietin, which has been around for a long time. And we use this to stimulate the reproduction of red blood cells in patients who are severely anemic and can't make their own red blood cells. And another example is platelet-rich plasma, PRP. PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, is blood plasma, and that's the part of blood with no cells. 
that's been treated and separated into a portion that contains a concentration of platelets. Platelets, in addition to the function that you're most familiar with, which is blood clotting, contain growth factors known to stimulate bone and soft tissue growth in a laboratory setting and also in the body uh, when they act naturally. PRP is actually harvested from your own blood uh, where we draw blood. The blood is spun down in a centrifuge and uh, then that produces layers in the tube uh, which can be drawn off independently. And one of those layers is the platelet-rich layer. Once that's drawn off, those platelets can be injected into the site of the injury to hopefully stimulate healing. So why is PRP so popular now? Well, one of the reasons is because it's not closely regulated by the FDA. It's your own blood that's just been processed. Uh, so it has less levels of regulation than uh, other products. And uh, therefore, many companies have commercially marketed PRP because it's easy to do, it's not heavily regulated. And that's resulted in something that can be used for almost any purpose without the need for scientific proof that it actually works, as evidenced by this ad from urbanbeautythailand.com. So does PRP work? Is there any scientific evidence besides sports endorsements? Well, unfortunately, not really. There are many published studies on the effectiveness of PRP, and most of the well-controlled studies show little or no benefit. So, should you get PRP for your knee arthritis or rotator cuff tear or tennis elbow problem? Well, it probably won't make you worse. Why doesn't it work? Well, what works in a lab often doesn't work in real life. And uh, I think the problem is more to how PRP is delivered as opposed to PRP itself. In other words, you have to deliver it in a way that that growth factor is going to stay around long enough to have an effect, which right now really doesn't happen. So is there hope for the future? Absolutely. Um, but there are very high development costs for these types of products if it's done correctly. And uh, insurance reimbursement always is a problem. And if you want PRP right now, there's a good chance your insurance company won't pay for it because of the lack of evidence. So what about stem cells then? Well, what are stem cells? They are undifferentiated biological cells that can differentiate into more specialized cells and then can reproduce to form more of those cells. They may also attract other healing cells to the area where they're implanted, and in that way they uh, act more like growth factors. And there are different types of stem cells. There's embryonic stem cells, which have unlimited self-renewal, but because of that, they can form tumors. And of course, there's the ethical problems of harvesting em embryonic stem cells from a viable embryo. There's placental stem cells, which come from the lining of the birth sac. They have limited self-renewal, which is actually good because they cannot form tumors. And then there's adult uh, stem cells, which have even more limited self-renewal. They can't form tumors, but they can only form limited uh, types of stem cells. So an example of an adult stem cell would be fat cells. To harvest placental stem cells, uh, we can take the birth sac or the amnion uh, from a mother who has a, a normal cesarean section birth and harvest that tissue sterilely and then process it so that it can be transplanted. The other advantage of stem cells is they don't cause an immune response uh, and uh, they can be considered a universal donor uh, similar to type O negative blood. They lack what's called MHC, the major histocompatibility uh, complex. What that really is, is just a spot where immune cells can latch on and cause an immune response. So what's great about stem cells is they can be transferred from a donor to a recipient without donor matching or immunosuppressive drugs, such as you need with a kidney transplant or a heart transplant. So what can a stem cell do for healing? Well, stem cells have the ability to transform into bone, tendon, and ligament cells. And they can also attract more cells to the area where they're present, like a growth factor. So theoretically, placing and keeping the stem cells around a tendon or ligament repair or a broken bone or placing them within a joint cavity can uh, improve healing. 
So do stem cells improve healing of tendon, ligament, and bone? Well, there are some early promising studies that show they can, but there's also some early studies that have failed to show improvements. And the bottom line is we really don't know yet. So should you get uh, a stem cell transplant for your knee arthritis or your rotator cuff tear or your tennis elbow? Well, it probably won't make you worse. Uh, you're going to have to deal with insurance reimbursement issues, and it's going to take a lot more money to develop uh, these products to where they're scientifically proven. Uh, we are actually beginning a clinical trial in July using amniotic stem cell membrane to augment rotator cuff repair. And uh, that's going to be a very preliminary study to see if it has a positive effect. And we'll let you know in about a year as to whether we think it's worthwhile doing for everyone. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you found it uh, interesting. And we'll see you on the beach.